All right, folks, we're, we're going to get underway here. Um, if you missed my introduction, I'm Joe Softley, Communication Marketing Associate with Classical Academic Press. I'm here today to facilitate our Get to Know Grammar webinar, the fourth webinar in our Get to Know Summer Series. We have already done Writing and Rhetoric. We have done Latin Alive. Last week, we did Logic and Rhetoric with... Jolie Hodge. If you missed that one, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, today, the focus is on grammar and well-ordered language, and who better to be with us than the co-author of the series, Tammy Peters. Uh, Tammy is a teacher. She's a reading specialist. Um, she's a grammar guru. And right, is that? No, yeah, probably. Maybe. I guess you could say, I don't know if the guru is the right word, but I have Oh, I do enjoy grammar. Grammar genius? Is that a little, is that, is that more fair? Come on, you've got you've to gotta let me brag on you a little bit here. Anyways, uh, I love listening to Tammy talk about grammar. She's been doing it for a long time, and she's the perfect person um, to talk not only about the Well-Ordered Language series, um, but about grammar. Uh, in fact, Tammy wanted to title this webinar, The Joys of Teaching Grammar. Unfortunately, I had to tell her that we had already pre-named all our webinars, um, but joy is an important word. It's an important concept that goes along with the subject of grammar. And she's going to bring a lot of joy uh, to this webinar today. So without any further ado, um, I'll introduce Tammy Peters. One thing I forgot real quick. Hold on, Tammy. We are doing a Q&A. You probably noticed that as you registered. And that'll take place in about 35, 40 minutes. Um, if you have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat box. I see everyone is still using the chat box to tell us where they're from. You can drop a question in the chat box. Um, a member of the Classical Academic Press team may answer your question live in the chat box. Um, if not, we'll hold it until the end and we'll ask it at the end of our session. If you have an extremely specific question tailored um, to the details of your co-op or homeschool, we may hold off on answering it. We like to tend to, we, we, we try to answer more general questions during these webinars. If you have a specific question, um, it'll be answered, um, but we may answer it through email dialogue um, we do that through info at classical subjects. Um, I will throw that into the uh, chat box here in a few seconds. Um, so you guys have that. So Tammy, uh, you can take it away from here. Joe, thank you so much. I have I always love working with you. You are just a delight and truly um, one of the many pillars that are at Classical Academic Press. I did, I honestly did want to label this the joys of teaching grammar with CAP just because there is going to be so much joy in it. But again, I was shut down on that. Um, but to get to know it, I hope you all come away knowing more and appreciating what well ordered language is all about. I can see many of you have written where you're from. If you haven't signed in and said where you're from, I love to know. It's, just, it's such a treat. Also, if you would mind in the chat box, if you have taught well-ordered language before, or if you've done level 1A or all of level one, whatever, could you add that to it? I'd love to know um, what, what you've been up to and where, where, who, who's doing what, I guess, is the best way. And thank you so much, Joe. Throughout the thing, I know you're gonna be adding um, different training videos and different information, and I know that will be helpful. All right, now, I always love starting webinars or any kind of my uh, workshops with poetry. Now, if you were here last time, um, the, last uh, the last webinar, I actually wrote a poem for the good of the cause, but today, we're in the middle of summer. We're in July, so I thought, man, I need a poem that has to do with one of my great joys. Um, when I was growing up, we, I lived in Wisconsin and my grandparents had a cottage right along Lake Michigan in Door County, Wisconsin. And if you're familiar with it, they were on the Sturgeon Bay side, the lake side. Anyways, many a days I spent walking that beach. Basically, they sent all the kids out along the beach, and that's what we did all day. We walked, it didn't matter if it was windy or if it's calm, the waves are high, waves are low. There were sweet memories. See, a beach is a place to imagine. It's a place to wonder. It's a place of curiosity. So I'm gonna share this poem, and as I'm doing this, um, 
I'd love for you, I'm gonna put the refrain up because I think the refrain is best appreciated. Here we go. Can y'all see that? Joe, can you see that? Hello, Joe? Yep, I'm here. Okay, good, just wanna make sure, can you see that? That's why I'm just checking. Uh, nothing up yet. Uh, uh, good to know. Go ahead and try now. There we go. There we go. You're good. There it is. All righty. So sit back and maybe you know this by A.A. A. Milne. It's called Sand Between the Toes. Imagine some great teach. I went down to the shouting sea, taking Christopher down with me. For nurse had given us six pence each. And down we went to the beach. We had sand in the eyes and the ears and the nose and sand in the hair and sand between our toes. Whenever a good north wind, Northwester blows, Christopher is certain of sand between the toes. The sea was galloping gray and white. Christopher clutched his six pence tight. We clambered over the humping sand and Christopher held my hand. We had sand in the eyes and the ears and the nose and sand in the hair and sand between the toes. Whenever a good Northwester blows, Christopher is certain of sand between the toes. There was a roaring in the sky. The seagulls cried as they blew by. We tried to talk but had to shout. No one else was out. When we got home, we had sand in the hair in the eyes and the ears and everywhere. Whenever a good Northwester blows, Christopher is found with sand between the no toes. So when I, when I put that and thought that, oh, I have to admit, I would love to spend more time on that poem and go through the grammar and talk about the grammar, the grammatical structure. And yet in well-ordered language, there are so many poems that you will have a chance to go through and enjoy, or you yourself are probably loving poems, to, to see the grammatical structure just gives the strength to the poem as well as just the imagery. But since I did share the, the, uh, the Milne poem, honestly, when I remember it as a, a little girl, at the end of the day, the joy of the beach came home with me. Oh boy, did I have sand everywhere. But it reminded me of the beach. See, learning about language can be very much time, can, can be very much like time on a beach. Yes, the sand tools are a must to create sand castles and forts. Knowing the eight parts of speech and understanding the structure of thought are tools by which you can help students construct great sentences. And yet some of you may be more like Anakin Skywalker who says, I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. Maybe learning grammar or language was coarse and rough and irritating to you. So I, I want to today give you um, a window into well-ordered language. And I want you to kind of walk along my beach with me and try to imagine a place of wonder and curiosity. And I want for you to view teaching grammar perhaps in a different way. Today I'm going to basically break it into three chunks after I kind of give a background behind it, but the first chunk will be basically an overview of the four, check, four levels. Um, and the next one is I'm going to actually demonstrate and analyze a couple sentences. And the last one is I'm going to just do key features of the chapters and lessons. Now if as we go along you have questions Oh, feel free to pop them into that chat box. And I know Joe will be monitoring those and we'll pop those in where they need to. See, I love, my love of grammar, basically, I guess I've always been a part of that, but in the late 90s, um, I homeschooled my own children. I, I, have, I have four, but um, they were four little ones at that time. And, and in the 90s, in the late 90s, you know, classical education was still gaining from momentum. Uh, many homeschooling and co-ops and startup schools, uh, classical Christian schools were being started all over. Even publishing companies, they were all in their infancy of understanding what classical education really looks like. Um, there really wasn't a lot of curriculum. 
So this began my own journey of wanting to know the how they used to do it, how, how the what and the how to teach grammar for that matter. And I came across um, Harvey's Grammar. And perhaps you're familiar with this as an, as an author. These are both Harvey's Grammar. This is uh, the elementary and then the secondary book that's within it. But what Harvey did with many of the contemporaries of the time looked at grammar in a different way, a way that I had never considered before. I guess I always learned it as being, I don't know, an editorial thing. You always had to find out where the comma belonged or why did you have a run on sentence? Or there was always these rule um, police that constantly were telling what I didn't do right and I didn't understand. What Harvey's brought to, the, to my equation, to my understanding, was this beautiful aspect of analytical grammar or the why behind it. You see, before that time, I was teaching Shirley Grammar, and I had, I had, I was quite, quite proficient. I had gone through all the levels, and I, I thought I knew it really well, but I was fine with my own kids. The, they knew the what, they could do the different patterns, but they didn't understand the why. They didn't understand why that was a predicate nominative. They didn't understand why this fit with this there was something missing. So my quest of collecting these old grammar books, and you can still find them, hit any antique mall or old bookstore, that's what I started collecting. And I started seeing this rich heritage that's been lost of the why. See, we as educators, as home educators, or in classroom educators, we understand macro thought. We teach our kids how to write a paper, how to write Let's see, the life of a jellyfish. Okay, you have your kids write that. And of course, they have to do the introductory paragraph and then the three supporting and then the concluding. And in, in, in that, you are structuring the thought. Well, when you look at a sentence, it's a micro thought because a sentence is just a group of words that express complete thought. So in that, you've got this aspect of a thought that has a frame or a structure holding it together. Why not teach it? It's been fascinating. Again, in my quest, I began realizing categorical learning was something I had never thought about. I never thought of adjectives as being a whole category of learning. I thought of more of it being kind of a concept that threw under grammar. But that, the more I dug, the more I realized, wow, adjectival elements or adjectives would be like the granddaddy, and then we'd have adjectives and then adjectival prepositional phrases, and then you'd have adjectival relative clauses or adjectival clauses. <gasps> wow, I began realizing categorical learning was something that I hadn't had before. So all that to say is my quest, um, one thing led to the other. The Lord sent us down to Mars Hill Academy, which is a classical Christian school down in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I began, I joined the staff. And in that quest of my taking Harvey's as my buddy, I began to write the curriculum at Mars Hill Academy. And I took the richness of the structure and I understood the frame of the child. And we sang definitions and we looked at every, we took analytical, um, analyzing a sentence and we took it on in a zealous way, I should say. So when a student, um, after we had clapped and sang all the definitions, we, we looked at a sentence, which I'll demonstrate in just a minute, and the students got to see it. They got to say the sentence. They got to hear the sentence. They got to kinesthetically actually mark up that sentence, and then they got to see that relationship. And at a glance, they could tell what the principal elements were and the subordinate elements within a heartbeat. My time at Mars Hill was fascinating because I was the anchor third grade teacher. But then every year they would have me teach a fourth grade or a second grade or a fifth grade. And all the while I would teach a grammar. I would always be the anchor, but then I would teach a fourth grade grammar. And then I would write the curriculum for that or the second grade, or the fifth grade. And so because of it, well-ordered language, the bones of it is, has a little bit of Harvey's and also Mars Hill as far as how we structured it. But how is this all thing? The, the heart of well-ordered language is the analytical aspect of it. The analytical approach, the choral analysis. 
So if I look at it, the overall, if I had to do an overview of it, there's just basically four levels. Level A is beginning grammar. It is A and B to it. Beginning grammar, your goal is learning beginning language. Okay, you're, you're learning the, the analysis. You are learning um, four kinds of sentences. You're learning about what a subject is. You're learning what a predicate is. Actually, just predicate verb. You're learning about the modifiers, an adverb, an adjective. All these are categories. You're learning what a direct object is. You also learn what subject pronouns and object pronouns are. Um, and then you learn all the compounds, compound subject, compound verbs. So you're learning good, basic, beginning grammar. By level two, you're learning an intermediate, intermediate grammar. Now you're getting a little bit more. You're going to start back right with the kinds of sentences. And you're going to also get, um, you will see, um, you will get back to the subject and predicate principal elements, you'll do the modifiers, but all of a sudden you will see, you'll be beginning to build. I miss, I, I, I didn't forget. Level one, we also learn the prepositional phrases. Level two, we will still do prepositional phrases, but now we're gonna add an adjectival. You will see as we continue to build. By level three, it's advanced grammar, both A and B. So level one, A and B is beginning. Level two, A and B is intermediate. Level three, A and B, is advanced grammar. This again, like all classical, it's layers of learning. So you go back to principal elements, but you're going to learn that depth. You're going to also learn the depth of the, um, in level two, you're going to be learning predicate adjective and predicate nominative. In level three, you're going to learn deeper nuances of it. You're going, to be, you're going to be learning about indirect objects. You're going to be, yes, you'll do principal elements, but you're going to also be learning adverbial clauses. It just continues to get stronger and better as you would want. You're going to learn about gerunds and infinitives and participles. How exciting is that? But level four is the granddaddy of them all. Now, if you've ever done grammar, this is where you always wanted to go, but you just had no one there to lead you. Okay, this is the place. This is where, again, we go back to principal elements, but you learn the deeper nuances of verbs for that matter. You can never exhaust your understanding of adverbs. They are wild children, you know. And as we continue each one, well, in it, level four, A and B, actually B, you're learning about participial phrases, infinitive phrases, and gerund phrases, and understand them perhaps for the first time. And then finish off with noun clauses. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting series. You see, in level one, we go back with beginning. Maybe, you're, maybe you are there or your little ones are there. The student's ability to speak outpaces his ability to analyze. That being said, the students may not have a, any clue on how sent, words behave in a sentence when they begin. But oh, at the end, they have this confidence to understanding the logic of thought. They begin to understand the logic of a sentence. His thoughts have started out scattered and undefined, and now all of a sudden, the student learns how to analyze a sentence and begin to think and write with more clarity. Level two, the intermediate side. Now here, the student's ability to think and analyze begins to emerge. The students build on what he has learned in level one with analyzing sentences, and now he brings in diagramming. Wow, this helps the students visualize what's happening in a sentence. Diagramming is just drawing a picture of a thought. By the end of level two, he is able to identify relative clauses. The level of sophistication is emerging even in his writing. By level three, advanced grammar. The student's ability to create a language is beautiful and structured. Since grammar is a structure around thought, the students gain the confidence of leaning into their grammar for direction. By the end of level three, he is able to identify adverbial clauses and, and he's introduced to gerunds and participles and infinitives. Those are the three verbals. Now, just a side note with that, many times when you learn those verbals, they are put with the phrases. 
it's almost overwhelming when you first introduce to verbals. So back when I was writing it initially, I used to clunk that back all together and I found that my top grammar students that understood it all, all of a sudden everything became really shaky when you added gerund phrases and participial phrases and infinitive phrases. So I pulled off the dogs and we just in level three, just concentrate on introducing the verbals so that when we get into level four, the students, they end up getting the phrases. See in level four, the intense grammar, the student's ability, not, um, it's not only your ability, not only is to think and analyze his language, but now he begins to command it. His level of understanding gives him confidence of knowing what he knows and why. By the end of level four, as I said, he's able to understand the verbal phrases, but also the noun clauses, plus so much more. So the what and the why becomes critical in understanding classical, educa a classical education. What to think and why became my goal so that my students were able to think about how they would speak and write well. So what I want now is I'm going to bring you to the beach. We're going to go and play on the beach, and I'm going to actually demonstrate these sentences. When I talk about choral analysis, maybe you've heard about them, or maybe you even have your book, and you looked over, and you're like, what is this? I'm going to show you. I think you'll enjoy this. So let's get started with it. Here they are. Okay. Now. I'm going to also put this in here. This has been the greatest tip. Again, as, as Joe said before, we have all become much more savvy with our Zoom. Um, if you find yourself in 2020 um, that you are doing your co-op in a Zoom call as opposed to, I mean, in other words, if you're just doing your own child, you can sit right next to them. But if you're doing a Zoom call and you need to go ahead and you're doing well-ordered language, how are you going to do it? I hope to get, show this to you. This was like a game changer for me. I'm so excited. If you have Microsoft Word, you'll see these little marks at the top, right? You got home, insert. Well, you've got, click, let me go back to home. You got regular home, right? You click draw, you've got all your drawing. Now, maybe you all know this before, but to me, I guess I never saw it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click this and, and what I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to be drawing right on my sentence. You can do this in your Zoom um, lectures or workshops or your classes as well. So if I were teaching this to you or I was with a class and I had, this is a level one, um, 1A or 2A class because it's, it's just basically very simple. I've just got principal elements and modifiers in this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna analyze this sentence for you. Please listen, okay? A white seagull did not fly very high. This is a sentence, because it's a group of words that express complete thought. This is a declarative sentence because it makes a statement. This sentence is about seagull. So, seagull is the subject, because it's what the sentence is about. This sentence tells us that seagull did fly. So fly is the predicate, because it is what the sentence tells us about seagull. It is a predicate verb because it shows action. There is no linking verb because predicate verbs do not need linking verbs. Did is the helping verb. These are the, uh, these are the principal elements because they're what is needed for the sentence to be, be completed. Hi tells us how the seagull did fly. So hi is an adverbial element because it modifies a verb. It's an adverb. Very tells us how high. So very is an adverbial element because it modifies a verb. It is an adverb. Not tells us how the seagull did not fly. So not is an adverbial element because it modifies a verb. It is an adverb. White tells us which or what kind of seagull. So white is an adjective element or an adjectival element because it modifies a noun. It is an adjective. 
A tells us how many seagulls. Oops, a little bit. That's okay. So A is an adverbial element because it modifies a verb. It is an adverb. I'm sorry, it's an adjective element because it modifies a noun and it is an adjective. Sorry. Let me clean that little spot off. Let me try that again. Oh, there we go. When you are doing the analysis, you can talk about the, the sentence prior to it or after it. Now, I just went, went right in because I wanted you to see and hear how it went. I gave you the full thing. You even saw me pause um, at one point because these are the principal elements because they're what is needed for the sentence to be completed. I, what I was doing in the very beginning in level one, we actually say that as helping them identify these are your principal elements. All the remaining parts are subordinate. And so in that, as you move on, parts of the script begins to drop off. But since we're still in the very beginning, I want you to see this. Here we go. These are all adverbial elements, okay? And they all modify verbs. And then, of course, I have adjectival elements because they modify the noun. Pretty straightforward. But if I had a sentence that had a little bit more by the end of by the end of um, level two um, two two B, you would be able to get a sentence such as this: One gray seagull encircled the waves that crashed the beach. Now, some of you are laughing, going, wow, she's really got a thing for beach. I can't, I want you to come play on the beach with me. I want you to see in my analysis while I was going ahead and saying that all that I say, these are scaffolding for children. Sometimes it's not that hard. I can see what the subject is. Why did you have to say all that? Actually, these are building blocks. This part of the analysis is there for you. In fact, um, as we go on, I'll show you, I wrote level one for the student in mind as well as you in mind. Most of us today view grammar very much being coarse and irritable like Skywalker did, view sand. But I want you all to end up seeing, oh no, it's not that hard, it's really delightful. So when I have a sentence as, as complex as this one, how would I go about it? Now again, this would be the end of level 2B, but I would start it. Same thing, but I would give them tools to attack a sentence like this. The order of analysis is phrases, clauses, principal elements, modifiers. Are there any phrases in this sentence? Now, if I was really doing the analysis right now, I would I would go right into it. But instead, I would talk to the students. Students, do you see anything in this sentence? What do you see? And I would talk about them and go, oh, on the beach, I think that might be something. Okay, what else do you see? What's about this? We would talk about the sentence. In fact, I'd probably link it to this one and see the story. There's a narrative going on. That's how I wrote the well-ordered language. Those four sentences, there's a, a narrative. Because students, because, Sentences don't show up in isolation. But when we come to the analysis, we don't stop. So I would go, one gray seagull encircled the waves that crashed on the beach. Students, the order of analysis is phrases, clauses, principal elements, modifiers. Are there any phrases? Yes, ma'am, what would it be? On the beach is a prepositional phrase. On is the preposition, oops. On is the preposition. Beach is the object of the preposition. By this time of the year, I could go the article adjective. Can the students be, okay. Are there any clauses? Yes, ma'am, what would it be? That crashed on the beach is a clause. This clause is about that. So that is the subject because it's what the clause is about. This clause tells us that that crashed. So crashed is the predicate because it is what the clause tells us about that. It is a predicate verb because it shows action. There is no linking verb because predicate verbs do not need linking verbs. 
on the beach tells us where that crashed. So on the beach is an adverbial element because it modifies a verb. It is an adverbial prepositional phrase. Let's go ahead and read the sentence again, class. One gray seagull encircled the waves that crushed, crashed on the beach. This is a sentence and it's declarative. This sentence is about seagull. So seagull is the subject because it's what the sentence is about. This sentence tells us that seagull encircled. So encircled is the predicate because it is what the sentence tells us about seagull. It is a predicate verb because it shows action. There is no linking verb because predicate verbs do not need linking verbs. Waves tells us what seagulls encircled. So waves is an objective element because it completes the meaning of the action verb. It is a direct object because it tells us what seagulls encircled. Seagull. That crashed on the beat tells us what kind of waves. So that crashed on the beach is an adjectival element because it modifies a noun. It is an adjectival clause, or also known as a relative clause. The article adjective, gray, tells us what kind of seagull, or which seagull. So, Gray is an adjective element because it modifies a noun. It is an adjective. One tells us how many, um, how many seagulls. So one is an adjective element because it modifies a noun. It is an adjective. Now, if you were listening, I hope you heard some of the changes, like some of the things I dropped, like that, uh, the, just that, uh, the is an article adjective. I didn't, I didn't say these are the principal elements. There are parts that are dropped in a script as you continue on, but there's a lot of stuff that stays. Principal elements. Did you catch that I always write them as capital letters above? Now helping verbs help the, um, help the predicate. So subject and predicate verb. In level two, you would also see um, predicate adjective and predicate nominatives with linking verbs. But there, these are your principal elements. This is what makes this, this happen. And if you notice, again, when I talked about your um, elements, right, those categorical learning, this is on the beach is an, adver is an adverbial element, okay? And an adjectival element is that crashed. Did you, did, you seeing this? They're wannabes. Once you teach the adjective, you can go ahead and, and talk about all the different parts of our language that acts like adjectives or acts like adverbs. So as we move on in level two, we end up doing just that. We end up diagramming so we can see the relationships. So you're analyzing it and you're diagramming it. Do you notice how the seagulls their wave comes right off? Now, when we think of beginning grammar, okay, I shared before four kinds of sentences, principal elements, adverbs, adjectives, direct objects, um, subjects and object pronouns, prepositional phrases, and then you have compound subjects, verbs, and direct objects. There's a lot that's covered, and some feel overwhelmed with that. I want to back off the dogs and say, no, 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 no. The reason how I wrote this was slow and steady wins the race. Chapter one is just on four kinds of sentences so that you can learn the script and your child can, or your co-op can, and you can do it with them. And, and as each one, you will, you will do it. So by chapter two, you will understand and learn the next part of the script. Um, I've had ones that have said, Tam, I, I don't want to bother with that. Well, you're missing the heart of well-ordered language. There is wisdom of learning the structure. I know I've shared this before and perhaps you've heard this before, but that scaffolding that surrounds sentences are critical to make that master masterpiece or that monument. Um, have you ever gone and seen things? And I, I've shared this. I actually, I was, went to Washington DC and wanted to see the Washington Monument and, and they had scaffolding all around it. 
Well, you didn't come to see the scaffolding. I understand that to be true. But without that scaffolding, the work on the Washington Monument couldn't be done. This is what beginning grammar is all about. It's starting with that scaffolding. It's helping to understand the beginning parts. Because intermediate, you get, as I said, what you're going to get in level one with diagramming. Plus, of course, you're going to be adding predicate nominatives, predicate adjectives, linking verbs, possessive nouns, um, adju um, adverbial as well as adjectival prepositional phrase, interrogative pronouns, compound sentence, relative clauses. You've got so much in intermediate grammar, but again, bit by bit, you will go ahead and build on that. By advanced grammar, you're again, you're, you're starting back at level one again in the sense you're learning principal elements, but you're learning deep. That's the classical way of learning, layers of learning. And in this one, you're going to end up learning sensory linking verbs. And pose, uh, you're going to also gain your depth in the, the three types of predicates and compound sentences, um, adverbial elements, adverbial clauses, and all the verbals that we talked about before. Intensive grammar, you're going to continue to compound each part with adverbial clauses, verbal phrases. Um, as well as noun phrases, I'm sorry, noun clauses. So without overwhelming, let's just kind of look at something like, well, what is a chapter? Now, maybe you have your well-ordered well language right in front of you. Flip open to any chapter, and you'll notice on your left there's a picture. If you're in levels one, two, and three, this picture is going to go with an analogy that's within the first two paragraphs or that first um, beginning, first two paragraphs on in the chapter. This is your time to observe. This is the time for discovery. This is the time to get the toes with sand between your toes. And then the ideas to understand is to explain. Okay, so you sit and you can enjoy and understand. Now, in the teacher's manual for you as home educators or as classroom teachers, you've got little bits of information. I call them from the sideline, like a coach. You know, I, I think of my kids when they used to play soccer and, and the coach would yell, go to the left, go to the left. Or they would yell some bit of information that would help their team know what to do because the game, you're in the game and this is just a side comment. That's exactly what we have on the teacher's edition. You've got these side comments going, oh, hey, this is another way you can do this. Oh, hey, you can find this information somewhere else or in the back or in the appendix or what have you. But ideas to understand is helpful for you to gain your bearings. If you're a little rusty on grammar and you're not quite sure what a predicate nominative really is, this is your chance to read and know. Terms to remember. This is, again, you're going to have this. This is where you get your MP3 and you download the songs and you sing and you play. You play in the, in the waves. You delight. Um, Again, if you're a home educator, this is the time you march around the house or you jump up and down the staircase or you do jumping jacks out in your front yard or whatever you like to do while you're singing. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you should have come to my classroom. I had them jumping up and down. I had them doing, um, when we did the eight parts of speech, they literally jump, launched in the air. Nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs, preposition, pronouns, conjunction, and interjection. We were marching everywhere. This is perhaps why the kids in third grade, I had students at the end of the year, I asked them, what was their favorite subject? They said it was grammar. They played on my beach. Sentences to analyze what I just did for you a moment ago. It is work. Sam does get between your toes, but oh, the benefits. The benefits will outweigh. Do not let it get chuggy though. Keep it light, keep it fun. Lessons to learn, if you have level A, you will also see an introductory section and a review. But for everyone, for the, all of them, they all have a lesson A, B, and C. This is your chance. You have four sentences, three to four sentences that you're going to be analyzing. You're going to be analyzing them out loud with your kids, at least the first two. Okay, this is, this is developed. And, and if they need a little more practice, that's where the 10 sentences are. But lessons to enjoy, there's those poems. You're going to enjoy a poem. Read it now. I've had, I've, I've, I often say, memorize this poem. You've got two weeks to do it. Maybe this might be one. You're already laughing, but I already memorized other poems. Perfect. Use those poems. Look in the poems that you have. 
Are there any prepositional phrases? Are there any subject pronouns? Subject pronouns sometimes are tricky to find in poems. Can you find an objective one? How is it being used? Those kind of questions, delight, delight. In the fables, you're gonna also find in your teacher's edition, fables or tales. And you'll find 10 sentences that are linked to that. Again, this is, this is um, 10 sentences that are keyed to a fable. So the, all the 10 sentences are actually telling an Aesop's fable. So what does a lesson look like? Lessons are all set up the same, basically. You're gonna have a review it. Review it is language of learning. This is where you sing and dance around. Now, if you are in, um, if you are in, less, in, in level one, your practice it will be um, in your teacher's edition. This is a quick interchange. Um, I guess level two, you will also have practice it in your teacher's section. But this is a quick interchange. This is where you're gonna do a, a quick, um, oh, I don't know if I'm, if, if the kids you're gonna do maybe a, a quick activity where you're going to be um, going back and forth like ping pong. So if I say a subject, you say the predicate. Or if I say, if I give a, um, if I say fish, you say, and then you would say fit swim or fish dive or whatever you're gonna do. And then you, you playing with language is what the joy is. You, you are, this is all getting the mind ready to go with it. Again, level one, you'll have another section here called Learn It, whereas the Learn It is incorporated in two, three, and four in your um, Lessons to Learn worksheet. Um, so review it, practice it, analyze it. This is how you're going to be taught how to analyze that kind of a sentence. And then Lessons to Learn. Now in Lessons in, um, Keep in mind in, in levels two, three, and four, you've got a sentence bank at the end of the chapter. More sentences that you might want to put on the board, independent work to um, play with or what have you. Um, level one, you have analyzed it sentences, you've, you have it before the lesson. Just little nuances between the, the levels. Now, I've come to, in level four B, I have um, a, uh, a challenge diagram okay so I have here oh crest why do you raise a roar rising collapsing surging on and heading toward the sandy shore till you wave and then you're gone see this poem I actually wrote mirroring a Christina Rossetti poem was a oh, wind but I wanted this in here today to spur you on or spur your students on, your own children. I want to have them go ahead and look at other poems and do imitation writing. I needed something that had participial phrases and I couldn't find a challenge poem that way, so I needed to write one so that I had one in it. How could you diagram something like this? Well, I'm gonna show you in just a moment, but I wanna sit there and tantalize your thinking. Okay, because I could do a challenge at the end of 1B, such as this, where of course you've got um, prepositional phrases. You notice you've got a compound, you've got a compound verb. So you're just writing a sentence that they are able to do and then see if they can analyze it. In level 2B, if I had this one, once more, here you go, whoo, you've got that rises and falls near, there is a whole relative clause with a compound verb in the midst of it. That's really exciting to have them diagram that. Again, you are writing this perhaps, or you can use the things that are in the book. There's so much material. In level 3B, can you imagine your child being able to diagram why do you, uh, why do you raise a clamoring roar that rises near the foaming shore as if you were summoning an army? Well, did you see that? You've got a, a participial, a participle here, and you've got a participle here, you've got a participle here. How fun would it be to go ahead and discuss participles in light of something that you write or they write? So there we are. We're back to our diagram, our challenge diagram. Well, of course, you'd pick out your participles and your participial phrases, and then, of course, you've got a, this is a compound, um, compound complex sentence or you've got an adverbial clause, you would by this point 
most of my students anytime would analyze it before they would actually diagram it. But some of you diagramming ones love to diagram and, and you see this is going, oh, yeah, that's how I would have done it, sure enough. Diagramming is a delightful way to see what is a sentence really about. Well, it's really about a question that you're asking to a wave, a quest of wave. Why are you roaring? It's just a fascinating thing. It's fun to go ahead. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of pull back here and we went through many things. We went through each of the different um, I talked about all the four, um, the four levels and discussed that, demonstrated. I um, gave you some key features of each of the, the chapters and lessons. But I wanted more than anything else for you to hear potential, hope to get the, the, the fears out, and instead that you come away with sand between your toes going, yeah, I think I'm gonna have fun this year. I'm gonna enjoy grammar. And I do want to, it's going to be hard work, but there'll be so much joy in it. So I'm gonna put at this point, Joe, do we have any questions that I can, or does anyone wanna come and jump in and ask me some questions? We have plenty of questions, Tammy. Oh, good. One second, dealing with the computer charge cord issue. All right. Yeah, we, we've had some great questions come in and been trying to, to handle them all. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and for your patience um, as we've been sorting through them, been trying to answer as many as possible uh, during, uh, during Tammy's presentation, but saved a few for Q&A. Um, Tammy, thank you for taking the time to go through that, too. Oh, yeah. wonderful, <clears throat> per usual. Um, I'll start with one we've gotten a, a couple different times, um, and that one is basically how independent can students be as they work through this curriculum? And maybe you could comment that on a uh, sliding nature from levels one through four. Can yeah. students become progressively more independent? Is there a high level of independency in, in level one? What are your thoughts? Um. Yes, independence. I, I would, it's hard because I, I taught it with, um, with a teacher directed interactive way. Um, and if you're, your child, you're thinking, well, I, I'm not going to roll up arms. I've got two other kids and I've got lots of stuff to, how am I going to do this? I know what at CAP they have a training videos and they have um, each of the analyze it sentences are I have I demonstrate that so I would I would encourage your, your child perhaps to go ahead and watch that with it and then because they need to hear the cadence I would really um, let's think of it this way okay so if you had your Latin okay and a moa masama okay so if, if you know there's chanting in Latin you need to have your different endings you know you need to um, do the flashcards or whatever. There's an oral component to it. Could they do it silently? Perhaps. Are they getting it? Perhaps. Same thing. Especially in level one, to get them into a um, understanding, it's a kinesthetic aspect of it. So again, if you can, you need to at least get them on the bandwagon. Get them going. I want to hear you, please, or you can tape record it or whatever the case might be. But that oral component helps not just to see it, but to hear it and to speak it. There's, there is modalities of scaffolding. And again, you're thinking, well, that's not the end all. I, I learned grammar just, just fine without doing it that way. But if I asked you what a relative pronoun is, um, could you? Could you help me understand what it does and why it does what it does in a sentence or a, or a predicate adjective or predicate nominative? Could you explain? That scaffolding is part of the understanding. And in level one, it's really hard to see where it's going, okay? 
Um, that's why perhaps I wanted you to see, oh, Crest, oh, Crest, why do you roar? I wanted you to see something that we're going toward. Because sometimes, as educators, you only know this year. And that's all you can handle because it's a lot. You're going to be covered. But you don't see where you're going. You don't understand how these things, and I have to understand that. In fact, Joe brought up that as a reading specialist. When I first started teaching, as a young little, I just got out of college, and I, I was a first grade teacher, and I knew what I knew, and that's all I knew. But when I became a reading specialist, it was like, it blew my mind to see the connectedness. And as when I became a home educator, same thing, I began to see oh, the connectedness between growing and learning and levels in the development. This is what's happening. So your question's long, I mean, my answer is quite long. To keep that oral component is important. So whether you, you, you link into CAPS training page, it's meant for you, but your, your, your child could listen to it so they could hear it, how to analyze it, to get that cadence. Because you don't want it draggy. You don't want to go, this is a sentence. Because it's a group of words that express complete thought. No. In fact, you can do it fast. You can do it quick. I drop it as I go. We're moving along because when you do get relative clauses, a relative clause behaves all like, in fact, a relative clause behaves all of like level one. All of level one could fit right inside of what you can do in a relative clause. So this is why level one is so important. So in level two, when you get it, you know what to do. How's that? Did I answer it? Thank you. Um, I had a question from, from Jamie early on that I wanted to bring up. Uh, and that question was essentially, um, how difficult is it for the educator, not necessarily the student, but more so the educator, uh, to jump into teaching levels three, and four, as opposed to starting with level one? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. If, if you're an educator that's teaching in a school and you just were hired and you are teaching well-ordered language level three this fall and all of your students are level one and two and you are coming in and you are a duck out, um, you may have one or two little ducklings in the room that are new to the school but frankly, you're at a disadvantage, in a sense. Um, I, I use the analogy just to understand how they are. Greek one, Greek two, Greek three, Greek four, okay? Level one, level two, level three, level four. You're jumping into Greek three, and that's what I'm hearing the question is, how do you get up to Greek three? How do you get up to level three? There is something, um, Joe, I'm not sure, is it on the market yet? You wrote the intensive we, prep. We can, we can talk about it. It's not here yet. We're excited about it. It's coming. Intensive prep is coming, and it is a literally a boot camp of a um, enough to give your students or to give you a handle on what to do so you could step into level three. It's intensive. It's a 10, 10 lesson um, getting up to that to teach your student who's coming into level three or you those categories so that when you meet them in level three, you'll at least be able to feel more comfortable. Um, but that's gonna be soon. That's how I would do it. If you don't have it yet, let's say I don't, I can't get to it or it's not ready yet, I would um, familiarize yourself with level, personally, I would get involved in 2A and understand those categories. And I would, I would take on 2A as opposed to 1A, primarily because there's diagramming. And that will help you to get you up and running. So if you're teaching in the, in the fall, I would get a hold of a 2A teacher's manual. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you, Tammy. Uh, the next one uh, is if you had to say, um, this might be a little tough, but if you had to pick one reason why this specific approach, the world or language approach, uh, is different from what else is being taught in homeschools or what's being taught in public schools, 
what would you say is the, is the one or maybe more than one um, key difference in the approach? Um, I think it's, I, I kind of brought it before, it's the what and the why. I think many, many, um, as again, for me, Shirley Grammer handled the what, and that was mind blowing to me. Again, I have a minor in English and I'd never heard of the eight parts of speech. It was like, in fact, even with Shirley Grammer, um, it didn't really get into the eight parts of speech, but it was, it, it got into letting me know that, wow, each of these words actually have categories. Okay, so that was my beginning step. But the why was missing. And so I think well under language, the, the benefit is understanding why is it a predicate nominative? Well, because it renames the subject. Well, why is it a predicate adjective? Because it tells the quality of the subject. Those are the pieces of it that make it unique and make it rewarding. Um, it's interesting because this is not something that just has happened. It might be kind of quote unquote new on the market, but this has been going on in Mars Hill for since early 2000s. And, and the benefits have been, um, it has strengthened their own understanding of their English. Obviously you've heard this before. It strengthens their understanding of Latin for that matter. Um, it strengthens their ability to think. You're training the mind to think. So that's those that we those would be my high hitting things. Let alone all the fun aspects, um, a delightful, clean, the simplicity of it. I mean, truly, grammar is quite simple. In the think of there's only three predicates. There's predicate verb, predicate adjective, predicate noun. That's that that's simple. Um, there's a clean lines. You've got your principal elements on the top and the subordinate elements underneath. Um, they're easy to mark and read. I mean, these are just benefits that kind of outweigh um, a lot of other things. But again, it's, and that, those are the things that I would guess I would highlight. Thank you. Among others, I know we- Among I know, others, I know, I, could, <laughs> uh, I know we could, we could talk about more um, highlights of the approach, but thank you for covering that one. Uh, I really like this next question because I think that it um, applies in a lot of scenarios. How would you recommend scaling teaching grammar for an older reader um, who's struggling? Um, the student would be old enough to understand the analysis, um, but reading ability is below comprehension. So in a case where reading ability is diminished a little bit, how can we approach the curriculum? Yeah, that's, it, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think I've shared this with you before, actually, Joe, and, and if you've heard this before, I was at a, um, at one of the conventions and a person came up to me and she had, um, some of, she was a homeschooling, um, educator and had two or three students or children that had, um, difficulties with reading and she just was so honoring and affirming saying that well-ordered language was just where was was so inviting and successful for their kids that she was so excited to get into level two she had gone through level one with them so that being said remember i had um, earlier on i said that the students ability coming into level one their ability to speak is way beyond where they are to, um, to analyze. So a lot of the sentences that we're using in the beginning are very simple sentences. They, and you can control your sentences. In other words, if, if the word, um, if the verb is too hard, um, you know, like, are they, they have a hard time with a verb, change it out, put another verb in there for that matter. But the sentences well, probably that you're analyzing would be at perhaps at that reading level. And if not, you can dial it back and just insert where it would be if you're doing level one for a, 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 a struggling reader. Um, I would sing. I would do a lot of oral work with them. I would not make this an independent thing whatsoever. I would have them delight in finding things. Um, pull out Little House in the Prairie if that's what you're reading, um, or even Frog and Toad for that matter. Pull out whatever they're reading, and you can 
find the principal elements in these sentences. You can find your adverbs, you can find your adjectives because the structure of those sentences are tighter. And so you can actually be teaching grammar and reading at the same time. And it may even help them, I mean, as a reading specialist, understanding the structure, knowing what would be missing in a sentence. Um, there's a strategy even to teach reading in that way of looking for your direct object, but you wouldn't call a direct object. Fill in that blank. Well, what is that blank? You're always looking for nouns or whatever the case might be. So I think um, this is a, a great tool to use even with struggling readers. Does that help? Thank you. Um, trying to move right along, cover as many of these as we can as we approach 4.15. We'll do Q&A for about another seven, eight minutes, try to get a, a couple more questions in here, and then I'm gonna share some resources with you before uh, we head out. So if you wanna stick around for the resources um, and, or more Q&A, please feel free to do, but we'll be wrapping up in about 10, 12 minutes. Next question for you. Um, I wanna talk about scheduling a little bit. How much time in a week What's our range that educators should be focusing on Walter language uh, in a week? And then a second scheduling question we've gotten, and I don't know how well you'll be able to, um, to handle this one because it, it may bounce outside your area of expertise a little bit, but in uh, merging a grammar curriculum with a writing curriculum, say writing and rhetoric, um, or really any classical writing program, um, how do we want to balance grammar and writing when it comes to scheduling, um, is it okay to focus on grammar one week and then writing the next and then grammar the next? So part A of this question, scheduling well ordered language, how time consuming is it? And then part B, kind of the grammar writing dynamic. If you could touch on that too, that'd be awesome. All right. Okay, so you got your book. In the early pages, it says lesson planning options. There's option A, B, and C. I don't know. Um, purposely, I wrote this knowing that you know your child better than I do. You know your circumstances better than I do. So with that being, um, if you chose, every chapter is to be done within two weeks. That's kind of how I based it out. So option A would be a four days a week for about 30, 40 minutes. Okay. Um, and again, presenting depending if you're doing level one or level two, level one, you would introduce it, and then you'd have A and B and C. It, it all explains it from that point. But by the end of the second week, you would have the quiz. Quiz is in a PDF. You just go ahead and get the quiz. Option B is three times a week. I'm working with a, a, um, a homeschooling group um, down in Texas that have it two times a week. How do you do this? So again, you're gonna have to balance out um, the different options knowing your situation best. But again, how I've designed it is within a two week period of time, um, 30, 40 minutes each time doing it. Option C is five times within a week and get it all done. It's an, it's, it's an aggressive, intensive way. So moving into Joe's idea to include writing and grammar in that time block. I've seen it, if you did option one, option A, you would do your grammar three times, four times a week, and then that Friday you would do it, writing would be the, would be in that time slot, depending how you set it up. You would be doing your writing on Fridays. On the option B, you could do a three days a week grammar, two days, um, writing in option c you'd have five days grammar next week five days writing five days grammar five days writing so you would get through it and you would balance it back and forth that way you're 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 limited by your own creativity knowing your own stipulations of what you can and cannot do but this is it is it is a grammar program and it isn't a quote unquote a writing program but it does dovetail well into writing and rhetoric in fact, you can use, in fact, some of you that have even pointed out um, the stories and writing and rhetoric are in well-ordered language. And the little ones are going, oh, there's my story. We did that one. Yes, they are. So there's, 
that's kind of building in that respect. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, next question. We've had a few of these. So I'm going to try to lump them into one question. Um, but essentially, I'd frame this as I have an upper grammar stage, um, early logic stage student, so sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Um, where would I place that student? And maybe you could go through each of those grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Yeah. If they've, again, Joe, I don't know if, if the question brought up, um, has the student had any grammar before? Because if he is a non-grammar person or if he's had some grammar, um, what we've done, in fact, I've, again, I'd love to hear what all of you are doing and how, or if you've talked with ones, but I do know how we set this up for whatever it's worth. Level one is third grade or fourth grade, third and fourth grade. Level two is fourth grade, fourth or fifth. Level three is fifth or sixth. And level four is sixth or seventh. Okay, so you're, you're, you're getting in those years, again, you're talking intense grammar in your sixth or seventh grade. Now I have a school um, out in Colorado that does level A and level one, third grade, level two, fourth grade, level, 3A in fifth grade, level 3B, this is, this is advanced grammar, level 3B in their sixth grade, level 4A in their seventh, and level 4B in their eighth. And the thing about their other fingers. Um, in other words, you are, you're limited. I, I did happen to say one of the questions, do you do both A and B in a year? My answer is, well, yes. Could you just do A in a year? Well, my answer is yes. Could you just do B in a year? My answer is, well, yes. So it really depends on how fast you're, you want to go with it, how far you are committed to go and take this on with your students. But it was designed to do a whole year in each of those grades. Now your upper grades, it is a little bit trickier because um, if they've never had, if they've been through well-ordered language and you finally get to level four, A and B, it is the most exciting. Now you're jumping the waves. Now you are literally, you, you're playing in the sand because now you've reached a time of sophistication and grammar that most graduate students don't get to. You have to appreciate the richness of the command of your language that you get when you finish level four. I, 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 I get really excited. So that being said, you don't want to shortchange yourself taking your sixth or seventh or eighth grade through it. Do it. Go with it. Go slow. Um, use your resources. You walk through it, but you will see a richness of language that, frankly, beginning grammar, you just can't get the delight of grammar. It's there. It's fun. But oh, to make those giant sandcastles. You just can't do that as much in the very beginning because they, they, they're limited cognitively and their, their, their scope of understanding. It's beginning, think of beginning Greek versus reading the Gaelic Wars. Latin, but but you, you see what I'm going with that? So did the, I hope that answered their question. Thank you, Tammy. All right, I'll wrap up our time together today with some resources um, and let's see if I can well like, while you're while you're finally like, doing that Tammy, last you thing are, Tammy you're the host now so I am unable to screen share I'm oh not, hey we'll just go ahead I'm not allowed yeah. to get permission back <laughs> there it is you're back you can make me the host oh there we go there's that studio you all, do you have it again? Thank you, ma'am. Yep. All right. I should be able to see this. Amy, can you see my screen? I can. What do Thank I have up there? You have Well-Ordered Language Level 1A program. That I do. So a few things that I want to show you. You can find these product pages on our site by going to resources. Um, it's our homepage right here, classicalacademicpress.com, going to resources product lines. 
You find well-ordered language all the way down at the bottom. Save the best for last, right? Well-ordered language writing and rhetoric, right, Tammy? <laughs> You'll find um, our programs here, front and center. If you click on the program page, couple things I want to show you. And Tammy, you can hop in and mention anything too. I know you're familiar with our site. First and foremost is the look inside feature. Um, when trying to determine placement for well-ordered language, this can be extremely helpful. Um, we offer samples for every well-ordered language product. So for the program, when you buy a program, you're getting a student edition. You'll see the sample for the student edition here. I won't scroll through it. Um, Teacher's edition, same thing, sample for the teacher's edition. Um, and then the Welder Language songs, uh, the songs and chants are included with the program. And then it looks like we have a, oh, we have the extra practice and assessments PDF in here as well uh, for level 1A. Those have to be bought separately though. Um, if you go down beneath product picture and again every product page has this product picture or lifestyle image and if you click on the image it'll open that sampler down here you'll find the support tab again we're just looking at level 1a right now but the support tab for every world or language product um, two pdfs i want to point out is the full series scope and sequence i have it open right here this is what it looks like um, but this is really well done, gives a really thorough analysis of what you can find in each level, from understanding grammatical relationships, sentence analysis, sentence diagramming, gives you a great snapshot of the whole series. So that's right there, full series scope and sequence. And then you'll find a suggested schedule for every level, level 1A, 1B, all the way through 4A, 4B under support as well. This is what that suggested schedule looks like. See the lesson planning options that Tammy was referencing earlier. Extremely helpful. Uh, and then finally, um, I wanna point out the water language level 1A, 1B songs and chants. You can find songs and chants for every level too. They come as part of the program. Um, so they come with the student edition, teacher's edition, or they can be bought separately. And it's an MP3 format that you can download directly onto your device and take them with them, take them with you uh, really wherever you go. So, any Imagine comments, quick, Tammy? Joel, finish up. You got one more. You were almost there. Go back, oh, go back, go back. What was it? <laughs> you, you were so close, Joel. You got to oh. show the training. So go back. Yep, I'm here. Can you see it? Yep, go go down to where the training. So you go back to support. Yep, click support. Yep. And then where it says the eight videos. That's where uh, I was talking about. Uh, different different page. Not here. Right. Let's see if I can bring those oh, well, up. Well, it is there. If you click that, that will get you in. Then you can show me two ways, right? Keep going down. I can see it right there. Go back up. Oh, whatever. Y'all can see no, this. I don't, I don't think it's on this page. But I can see it. Says, well, oh, right here. Right, right here. Click. There you go. Thank you, Tammy. Tammy, Tammy found it. <laughs> well, it is kind of tricky now to find. Uh -huh. So this is our well language landing page. We're doing some maintenance on these pages. But what Tammy is referencing here is the teacher training videos. I'm going to go about them this way. So well -ordered language. I'm going to drop this PDF uh, into our chat box before we're done so you can access this. But this landing page provides video overviews with my good friend, Tammy Peters, model lesson and a grammatical overview. And then down here, Tammy, I think you were referencing these teacher training videos, yep. level 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A. Yep. If you click on these, it opens sentence analysis instruction. We had Tammy here last year to record these, right, Tammy? Mm -hmm. Last year. Uh, and this is a great tool for individual homeschooling, for schools, for co-ops. Works well. Anything to say about these, Tammy? I think again, they're 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 all tied to the analysis, um, sentence to analyze in the very beginning of it. So there are for every chapter there is one of them, and so they'll be helpful to you. You can tell because I 
you know, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. It all depends on how many sentences we're analyzing in it. So that's just helpful to y'all. Thank you for pointing that out, Tammy. That's good teamwork right there. Oh, we work as a team. I'm going to drop in that link for everyone. If you want to copy and paste it, bookmark it, whatever. Classicalacademicpress.com backslash pages backslash well ordered language details. Uh, and we're going, we're working on a, a set of new series pages that'll make those videos a lot more accessible uh, and easier to find on our new website. We switched over to earlier in 2020. Uh, it is 420. We're going to wrap up now. Um, if you have any more questions, like I mentioned earlier, please feel free to uh, send us a message on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or send an email to info at classicalsubjects.com. Um, you can also reach out to me at marketing at classicalsubjects.com. So two options for you to get your questions in. Uh, we did have a few more detailed questions today that we'd love to answer um, through a longer email thread. Um, or even a phone call. Um, and you can find our number on our website under the contact us page. Tammy, thank you so much for your time. Any closing thoughts from you? Oh no, go play in the sand and have fun this year with grammar. I echo that. Uh, thank you all for uh, continuing to invest in the classical renewal uh, and in classical academic press. We're honored to uh, work alongside you as you prepare for the 2020-21 school year and beyond. And we will be coming to you with another Get to Know webinar. This next one is Get to Know Lower School Latin, uh, and it is headed your way on July 29th. It's two weeks from now, uh, and it's going to be with Dr. Christopher Perrin. You might have heard of him. Uh, he works around here, uh, and he also founded this company 19 years ago. So we're excited to do a webinar uh, with Dr. Perrin in two weeks. Thank you again, Tammy. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. Be blessed. Uh, have an amazing week. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.